The pandemic brought on a boom in the housing market, with home sales reaching the highest level since 2006. I know I spent a lot of time perusing Zillow. An insatiable demand in the housing market right now, causing sales to skyrocket. That from one prominent housing expert. As new home sales soared 19% over last year. People in general looking at a home that they want to buy or build, their first question is not, do you have sprinklers in this building? Or do they look around and see this beautiful forest and say, oh my God, it's gonna be on fire in two years. 2020 also meant a lot of natural disasters. It was the worst fire season in US history, and there were over a dozen severe weather storms that each cost over a billion dollars. We're not going to be able to create fireproof houses, non-ignitable fireproof houses, because by and large, nobody wants to live in those. Building towards a resilient nation saves money, saves the environment, saves lives. In 2019, just shy of a million new people were displaced due to climate disasters in the US. The good news is that that number is down from 1.25 million in 2018 and 1.7 million in 2017. We're delivering a very safe product that is making people's lives so much better. Could we do it better? Absolutely. We can always do things better. Cost is a big consideration. I know it was for me when I was doing my Zillow research, but I'm lucky enough to be able to afford to rent an apartment with adequate safety measures. For example, this fire sprinkler. So America needs to get a lot of people into homes that can withstand the ever-increasing wrath of natural disasters quickly. But is the U.S. approaching building homes all wrong? And how should houses be built in the U.S.? Nearly 1.3 million privately owned new housing units were finished in 2020. Those should have been built to the building codes and standards set by local regulators, usually based on guidelines from the International Code Council or the ICC. The codes basically say if you have this kind of function going on within a building, in this kind of building, you can use these standards in order to meet our level of safety, sanitation, etc. When you build in an area, one of the first things you do is you acquaint yourself with the exact code requirements that will affect the development and building process at that specific site. Then the specifics, you also check against the code as you go. Though we at FEMA are active in that process and engage in promoting these hazard resistive building and fire codes, it is really down to the local level to adopt, adopt and implement those new codes and standards. Industry experts try to keep up with changes in technology and include evolving environmental factors when designing codes. Every three years they republish their codes. It goes before a committee that review these things in a public hearing format. That then goes back out to the entire mem membership. A ballot is open to them to come in and vote on whether they want to see this code change be introduced. I think one of the biggest challenges in a code development process is there are all sorts of competing interests and needs. And it's really important that if you have a, if you're a proponent of a code change and you're trying to move that code change forward, uh, you, you have to engage in the process. These codes are enforced at the local level. Punishments could include revoking permits or holding up construction. And in construction, time is money. A thousand dollars added to the price of a new home at any time in any way we will eliminate 153,967 households from being able to buy that home. Just a thousand dollar increase. A faster build might help save money in the short term, but be devastating in the long run. The last hurricane we saw in Florida with that one house left standing on the beach uh, was a rather interesting solution. 
Um, it was a, an extremely expensive solution, but it was a lot less expensive than the solution that all their neighbors had when they were didn't have a house anymore. Since the first edition of the I codes, the international codes, for example, in, in 2000, communities that have adopted them have saved the nation approximately 1.6 billion, that's a B, billion in average analyzed losses from flooding, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Building to withstand the forces of nature can be tricky, especially as our understanding of the environment changes. If you're looking to buy a home, the best thing you can do from a flood perspective is know what your current risk is from the current environment and then how that will evolve over the next 30 years. And flood risk isn't a static uh, one-time thing that you need to look at. It is an ever-evolving risk um, that continues to grow in some parts of the country at an exponential rate. Since building codes can change frequently, staying up to code is easier said than done. For example, depending on when a home is built in a community, different flood or fire regulations may be required. If you have a large community, you can find yourself building under different code requirements. And what's also quite easy to evaluate is the increases in cost, for example. Homeowners may choose to invest in resiliency measures to stay up to code as opposed to buying a brand new house. If we work toward addressing existing structure as well as new homes, what we find is that at times there's so much focus on the new that they bear way out of percentage what the price tag should actually be. So we can't have that burden on new homes because we're losing too many first-time buyers, first-time move-ups. There are examples all over the country where communities have evaluated their risk and then uh, adopted resilient uh, current building codes to address that. For example, a fire may not cross the street if nothing on the other side of that road ignites from the embers. Communities that are flood prone may choose to build trenches in the street to catch excess rainfall, as opposed to letting that flood into a home. So what we want to make sure of is that we eliminate most of the ignitions. And in high density neighborhoods, we can begin to do that with very limited or no window exposure between houses and we can have the the exterior materials non-flammable including our eaves and the boxing of our eaves using let's say fiber cement so we can have fiber cement on the walls we can have a non-flammable masonry material like block or something on that order, um, and then use a non-flammable material for eave facing and boxing. Okay, non-flammable roof, that will help greatly. Flooding is a little trickier than fire, but the floodplain map provided by the National Flood Insurance Program provides some guidance for stakeholders. I would say it's less about from my perspective, whether we're building the houses incorrectly and more so where are we building these houses? So when you look at the things from FEMA and the special flood hazard areas, they come with a base flood elevation. Uh, those base flood elevations are built on engineering grade, well, amazing studies that they do at that time. The problem is that about 11% of those studies are from the 70s and 80s. And if you think how the environment has changed since the 70s and 80s, to not then have that incorporated in the new base flood elevation and where we should be thinking about building and why, you start to see why that can be an issue. You know, further to that, there's a whole swath of the country that just doesn't have any regulation around this within the special flood hazard area because it's never been mapped. The codes can't solve everything. A resident's behavior has a huge role in stopping fire spread. It won't help us if we keep our firewood on the deck all through the fire season. It won't help us if we have patio furniture that's ignitable from firebrands next to our, our uh, uh, the, the view windows. Research like Cohen's can save lives and billions annually. Being cognizant of where structures are built is important too. There's lots that the individual homeowner can do 
to help prevent a fire from actually spreading further or causing more damage um, than if you just didn't take any action or maintaining your yard and other items like that in a very similar way to flood where you can raise your home or you can put in backflow preventers or you can have uh, sandbags and other things like that ready for those flooding events when you know they're coming. The good news is that displacement due to natural disasters is on the decline, mostly because of better research and innovations to address the issue. Our perception of the wildfire rolling through the community like some tsunami of hot gases, that is not what happens in reality. We've also had significant success in improving fire safety in the past. I don't know about your apartment, I think I see sprinkler head in the background. Um, that's why. And that has been uh, incorporated into the model codes in some degree. I wish it were stronger. Uh, but there are those who think that's a uh, burden, uh, it's a cost impact issue. Uh, it's difficult in some communities because of water supply issues. Um, there are problems with it. It's not perfect, but it's certainly better than not doing anything. We created a national flood model across the entire contiguous United States that can be applied to an individual property parcel. So based on the building type, the elevation of the building, the value of the structure, and our flood model, we're able to leverage the Army Corps of Engineers, what are called depth damage curves, to know how much water would equate to what damage to that structure, and then calculate that on the fly and give it to you as the user. So now not only do you know how much risk you have, but what that'll likely cost you if that event does take place. They plan to move to fire next. Cohen is collaborating with federal and local officials to better inform builders to stop the spread of wildfires through his home ignition zone research. Fundamentally, we need to define the problem as a structure ignition problem, not a wildfire control problem. We have a lot of decisions we can make effectively in changing the local conditions of the house and its immediate surroundings and we have zero opportunity to control extreme wildfire. This effort is also supported extensively at the federal level by FEMA. I really want to encourage people to go to the FEMA website, download the app, go to the United States Fire Administration's website, download the information. There is a tremendous amount of great information there for individuals to help them be resilient before, during, and after a disaster. Architects and builders suggest that consumers like me need to adjust our mindsets to include safety as a top consideration. This will allow people to make the necessary adjustments to stay in their homes longer and therefore slow the flow of climate migration and have better financial investments. People see the events occur, the wildfires, the floods, um, the, you know, daily news that somebody died in a house fire. Um, but it doesn't stick. It doesn't change their perceptions. Um, and that's to a certain degree why architects are there to guide their thinking to say, yeah, you could have that, but you know, for the same price, you could put a sprinkler system in this entire building and be relatively assured that your family is going to be safe in it for the next 50 years. The homeless crisis in America is worsening again. The COVID pandemic caused a surge in housing costs and a rise in unemployment leaving nearly 600,000 Americans unhoused in 2020. We have to shut down a piece of our own humanity to be able to walk past another human being that is in such a difficult situation. And being homeless, your, your days in were spent from where I'm going to lay my head at tonight, where I'm going to get my next bite of food from. And what people don't typically realize when they walk past a person who's homeless is that this person is costing taxpayers a lot of money. Cities across America are spending more than ever to combat the crisis. In 2019, New York spent a record-breaking $3 billion to support its homeless population. California is also expected to break its record 
allocating $4.8 billion of its budget to the same issue over the next two years. And areas like that just don't seem to be getting any better, despite the fact that every politician claims that this is a top priority of theirs and the budgets keep going up. Overall, homelessness in America has only improved 10% compared to 2007. It's even worse for certain subgroups such as individual homelessness, which dropped only a percent in the same period. On the contrary, 2020 saw a 30% increase in the unsheltered homeless, erasing over half a decade of work since its dramatic rise in 2015. Right now, we are trending in the wrong direction. Uh, so the state of homelessness right now is, is pretty tenuous, uh, and there are some small increases that are taking place uh, across the board. So how is the U.S. addressing the homeless crisis, and can it ever be solved? Homelessness is known to prey on some of the most vulnerable populations in America. In 2020, 20% of those who were unhoused suffered from severe mental disorders, while 16% suffered from chronic substance abuse. In response, the U.S. has long relied on a housing-ready approach to homelessness, where those who are unhoused had to meet specific requirements such as sobriety or completion of treatment in order to qualify for a home. That was until this man, Dr. Sam Simbaris, pioneered the Housing First Initiative. At some point, myself and the people we were working with realized that really insisting that people change, get sober, take medication, get your life together in order to earn or be uh, awarded housing was not working. It was just, you know, people couldn't. People were on the street. They couldn't stay sober. They couldn't. They were not interested in, in medication. They were interested in being somewhere safe and secure. The Housing First initiative follows two tenets. First, the most effective solution to homelessness is permanent housing. And second, all housing for the homeless should be provided immediately, without any preconditions. Putting people in housing first, which is what they were desperate to do, calms that survival thing, and people are safe, secure, and then they're saying to us, I need more help here, you know? So then rather than having it us pushing or coer coercing people to get to treatment, people get housing and then they want treatment. Under the George W. Bush administration, the Housing First initiative gained the spotlight as the key to ending homelessness. Related programs soon received billions of dollars in support from government agencies, such as the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Housing First's rise really begins in the 90s, especially the, in the late 90s, and I think it really gained traction as the philosophy that should dominate those dedicated homeless services agencies and programs. And so we are, we're in a situation now where you meet people who work at HUD on homelessness or in major agencies in California and New York. It's relatively rare to not find them be committed to housing first. If you really look at it this year, um, it will give, the federal government will give about $2.7 billion uh, to housing and service providers and housing and, and, and cities across the, across the country. For decades, the Housing First policy has successfully housed individuals that need it the most. Shannon McGee is one of them. A nonprofit organization, Pathways to Housing, helped Shannon move into his support of housing in 2020 after staying unhoused for four years. It started in 2008, um, losing my mom to lung cancer, and then not having a strong support system to support me throughout the process. I ended up losing the family house. They sold the family house and didn't have anywhere to go. And that started the, the, the stint of being homeless. From being housed to now being unhoused, the shelter for me was very hard to, it was a cultural shock. It was very hard to adjust to the, the environment, the living standards, I finally got connected to the Veteran Affairs and a social worker with them connected me to Pathways. Um, and since being connected to Pathways, everything has turned around 360 degrees. I'm, I'm housed, I'm gainfully, I'm looking for gainful employment. I'm in school now, so that, and not without having Pathways there to kind of be that support and that coach to guide me into housing, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. 
A study in 2004 discovered that when individuals were provided with stable, affordable housing with services under their control, 79% remained stably housed at the end of six months. Another study in 2000 found it to be more effective than traditional programs. 88% of the participants in Housing First programs remain housed compared to just 47% in the city's residential treatment program. And it's not just in the United States. A similar study conducted in Canada revealed similar results, showing participants of Housing First programs obtaining and retaining housing at a much higher rate. The evidence has shown that by getting people housed uh, immediately uh, and eliminating the chaos of homelessness created a space where people would be more successful. I don't have to be in that environment anymore where I'm subjected to using drugs or to doing things for money that I didn't want to do. Um, I can change my, my, my focus is now I can say, hey, you're housed. How can we get you to your next level of finding gainful employment? What, what steps can we work on now? Housing First not only supports those in need with housing, but the assistance they need to get back on their feet again. It's Housing First, not housing only, because there are very rich services, like there's a team of people, really, whether they're social workers or social workers and nurses and psychiatrists, people with lived experience, it's like a support services team. And then the team says to you, how can I help you? They provide wraparound support for me. So um, if I need assistance in getting things such as my ID or birth certificate, they help with that. They support me through that process. If I need to make appointments at the VA hospital, they support me through that process. What any and everything that I pretty much need done, I have support through Pathways to Housing. Supporters of Housing First also argue that it's cost efficient. A comprehensive study in 2015 concluded that shelter and emergency department costs decreased with Housing First policies. What people don't typically realize when they walk past a person who's homeless is that this person is costing taxpayers a lot of money. People get very sick when they're homeless. They have to be taken to the hospital. Sometimes they, they steal food, they have no money, they get arrested, court costs, police time, jail time. When you tally up the annual costs of people who are homeless and very vulnerable, it turns out we're actually spending sometimes $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year in some cases, and, and the person is still homeless. But perhaps the biggest advantage to Housing First is the improvement in the quality of life it provides. Being homeless and being a parent, I kind of didn't want my child to see me in, the situ in that situation. So it made, it kind of put a wedge in our relationship for a little bit. But once I got housed now, I could provide a space where we can interact together and she wouldn't have to be subjected to that, that, that lifestyle. Being able to have my housing first, I know that I'm in control of my environment now. What happens here, it's all about what I, I, I create. But Housing First also comes with its own set of criticisms. Experts like Stephen Ide from the Manhattan Institute believe that Housing First hasn't shown any real result. When the public is told that this particular policy is going to end homelessness, what they're expecting is that they're going to see fewer homeless people around that homelessness numbers will significantly drop as a result of the implementation of this policy. And I don't think that we've seen that in the case of Housing First. Critics also point out that Housing First might not be as cost effective as it looks. Research in 2015 discovered that while permanent housing intervention was more successful in achieving housing stability, it was also more expensive than temporary housing. A 2018 survey by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine also concluded that there is no published evidence to prove that permanent supportive housing improves health outcomes or reduces health care costs. No government that I'm aware of has saved money by investing in homeless services through a housing first approach. You can talk about potential cost offsets, that is if you invest a million dollars in housing first that will trim some of the budgets and some other service systems, you're not going to actually save money, reduce the cost of government to the point where you could be talking about, let's say, a tax reduction as a result of investing in housing first. So I think that there, was, there has been some misleading of the public 
with respect to that concern. There is also the question of whether the need for housing actually triumphs over the need for treatment. If we want more from people, we have to be talking about um, far more than just housing, but in the Housing First era, there's a way in which housing just continues to suck all the air out of the room, and all we keep coming back to is, are we doing enough to expand the stock of subsidized housing to help the homeless? Meanwhile, Dr. Simbaris argues that the criticisms towards Housing First are designed to blame those who are unhoused, rather than to assist them. They want to go back to treatment and sobriety first, you know, and then housing maybe because that changes the entire narrative back to homelessness is the fault of the individual. You know, anybody who fails in a capitalist society like ours, you know, with no, you know, taxation and no government is only because it's their fault. Housing First hit its first bump under the Trump administration that sought to replace it with programs focused more on treatment and sobriety. They were talking about housing fourth, as a policy, housing fourth, okay? And that was very deliberate because it's housing first. And they were like, no, housing fourth, you know, treatment, sobriety, employment, and housing maybe. You know, that's, it was a very, very a targeted attack. The Biden administration, however, showed a return to housing first. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 included 70,000 emergency housing vouchers and a staggering $350 billion in state and local fiscal recovery funds in an effort to aid homelessness and housing instability. The Biden administration absolutely supports a housing first approach. They feel that in, 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 a, in a society as ours, that housing should be a right and not a privilege that every American deserves a safe and stable place to call home. So they are, you know, providing the, the, the resources and, and the support. Critics of Housing First believe that lawmakers need to be giving more alternative policies a chance and approach the homeless crisis in a more structured manner. We need to have them invest in a broad range of programs, residential programs, that can benefit the homeless population in all its variety because the homeless population is very diverse. Within that framework, Housing First-like programs would have a place, low barrier programs would have a place, but they would not rule the roost in the way that they currently do. Those in support of Housing First believe that more resources and support from the government are needed to truly end the crisis once and for all. Well, if you don't have the resources in the program to deliver a place to live, then your listening and your promise to them is hollow. You need to have the listening, let's call that the policy, which is you know housing first, you know, person first, but then you need the resources behind the policy, apartments, subsidy, support services, in order to actually make the package viable. You know, we're nowhere near where we need to be in investment, uh, either of building, uh, public housing or affordable housing, uh, having you know the, the capacity to address the homeless, homeless problem, we're, we're nowhere near. What's important is that homelessness is a crisis that can be solved as long as there is enough attention, care, and resources to support the cause. It's just very disgraceful that in a country that's um, so blessed, so wealthy that has done some things right in the past, if not everything, um, that we can't do something um, to, to fix this problem or at least get it, make it smaller, um, ameliorate it. So there's a lot of good work going on. So that's what gives me hope, that we can actually turn the nighttime stars into a daytime where we just turn up the lights enough to really end it for all because the other thing that gives me hope is we know how to do it. We have the cure. We have good examples of how it's done. We need to take it to scale. The affordable housing crisis in the United States continues to be a problem, and it's only getting worse. Nationally, there's a shortage of about 7 million affordable homes for our nation's more than 11 million extremely low-income families. We have a multi-trillion dollar shortfall in the United States in providing housing for nurses, school teachers, bus drivers like my father. This is a critical issue that affects all communities. And some areas are hit particularly hard. 
the cost of affordable housing kept climbing about 10% a year to the point where it hit $800,000 of construction costs to house a family in San Francisco. That's just construction costs. The pandemic and the loss of jobs and as for the affordable housing problem is gonna get worse in the short run. One solution that's gaining traction are factory-built modular homes. And Tecra, Blue Homes, and Blockable are a few companies using this building technique. Connect Homes, which is led by a former Apple exec, has raised $27 million to do the same. Google and Facebook have invested in another company, Factory OS, which is building affordable homes in the Bay Area. The company says it can reduce the cost of construction by 20 to 40 percent. We build apartments very much like we build cars. We stack them like Legos on the building site, and then you have a completed building. The cost of construction has soared. And in San Francisco, it's some of the highest in the world. The construction industry in general is really slow to change. And its adoption of technology is much slower than other industries. But they're starting to realize that isn't going to work. Traditional construction is no longer sustainable cost-wise. Now, the biggest tech companies are offering support to the problem that they helped cause. Both Google and Facebook have pledged a billion dollars. And Apple has committed 2.5 billion. The technology community is in some regards responsible for our housing problem because they've created almost 800,000 jobs and we haven't been able to keep up with the housing. If you move to these modular methods, not only are you driving down the cost, you're making it easier to assemble them on site so you can stand them up quickly with less disruption to the neighborhood. If you use volumetric construction, you're gonna save anywhere from 35 to 40% of your construction time. We've gotta start using the technological resources available to building housing differently. The big issue is productivity of how housing is being built, 60 to 75 percent, depending on what kind of project it is, is in the hard construction costs. Construction costs have steadily been rising. Nationwide, prices have gone up about 5 percent annually for the past three years. Construction, the AEC industry, is one of the most inefficient industries out there. It wastes more money, materials, it wastes more time than any other industry. We need to get the entire building community to reform itself. And that is very hard to do because there's so many special interests. The industry is also faced with a labor shortage. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, 83% of contractors reported moderate to high levels of difficulty in finding skilled workers in 2020. We have been losing construction workers because millennials aren't going into the business. The immigration policy squeezed out a lot of the workers. And then there's retirement of people that are sort of boomers that were feeding the industry. Contributing to these inefficiencies is a lack of standardized workflow between the different construction teams. It has to get a lot more like manufacturing, where you have kind of these unified supply chains that come together and work. However, new approaches and technologies used in factory-built homes are providing much-needed efficiency gains. As these industries become more and more dependent on technology and they start to see less waste, faster time to build, they can build before they actually break any ground because they do it digitally first. We can put a building together in a computer and understand its cost, all of the potential log jams that oftentimes don't find themselves a problem until you're building. Modular is a big part of lowering the cost of that construction piece. Also known as prefab, modular construction is when a builder constructs units in a factory and then delivers them to the site where they are assembled into the full structure. There's some very large companies in Europe and even in Japan that have proven out prefabrication and modular construction methods at scale. The concept of modular construction isn't new. It was a popular building method in the U.S. and U.K. following World War II. I think it's a growing trend. I would say it's, it's pretty incremental, and there have been some startup companies that haven't been successful. Some companies have attempted to build this way in the past, but have struggled. In 2016, California-based Zeta Communities closed after running out of funding, and Katera recently received a bailout from SoftBank to avoid bankruptcy. They struggled because they were trying to Uberize it in some respects. Let's just shove our, our approach into the system. You can't do that with construction. It's too complicated. 
Advances in technology and building have caused a number of new startups to pop up. Factory OS builds modular homes in an old Navy submarine factory and has raised $77.7 .7 million so far from companies like Google, Facebook, Citi, Morgan Stanley, and Autodesk. Google placed an order for us to build some apartments. Facebook is really helping us with a very uh, ambitious communication strategy to educate people. The home modules are built in an assembly line. We have 33 stations through the building. You need to think of it a great deal like automobile manufacturing. You start with the chassis and you start building the parts on it as it goes through the line and then it comes out as a finished product. The first part of building the house is really the floor. In station two, it gets moved up to about six feet above grade. People can work above and below it. So you can be doing electrical work that needs to be in the floor, venting, insulation. Compared to a typical project, Factory OS says this method is more efficient with labor and materials. If you and I were at a conventional construction site, you would see an enormous amount of downtime with workers standing around waiting for instructions. Once we start fabrication, we've already done our own time-space managements to understand the labor that's required to make sure that we're adequately staffed to be able to perform the tasks. It takes about 14 days for a module to be constructed in the factory. Once complete, it's transported to the construction site and assembled into structures of up to five stories tall. We can build one bedroom studios, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. We can nest our volumes. Just think of it like Legos. They can be 244 square feet or they can be 2,000 square feet. If you're a neighbor of that construction activity, it gets erected practically overnight. There's very little disruption. So far, Factory OS has built projects ranging from homeless housing to market-rate apartments. We have probably now $200 million of orders for our units on the books. We did during this year actually get another factory that sits behind the factory that we're in right now up and operating because our demand is so high. If modular construction can offer the time and cost savings it claims, it could transform affordable housing. We have big aspirations that we can be producing housing that was costing $800,000 down to $200,000. Besides making these projects more affordable, there could be some benefits for the construction industry as well. It's about a third of our workers weren't in construction a year ago. We're paying them twice what they were paid in their previous jobs. We're giving second chance workers a big part of an opportunity here. Roughly 50% of all the tradespeople here, we trained ourselves. The working environment can be better for laborers. It's a hard job lifting sheetrock on the fifth floor of a building and doing a ceiling. And when you see how we do a ceiling in the factory, it's a lot easier on the worker than it is on a conventional site. There are environmental benefits for those workers. There's family benefits. They're not commuting the same distance. They're working, whether it's raining or whether it's snowing or whatever climate condition. As Factory OS looks to expand, it could be helping Los Angeles next, another area in desperate need of affordable housing. Southern California is twice the market of Northern California, and we've already had a very serious inquiry from LA for us to build a large order of supportive housing that they need. And while California might get the most attention for its housing crisis, there's opportunity in almost every city. The market potential is beyond enormous, even, even with my crazy imagination. We're a small market share right now. I think over the next five years, you're going to see that we're, we're going to have a much larger uh, market share because it's faster, it's more economical, and it's more predictable. Teachers and nurses and baristas, the whole nine yards, they need to be located in an ecosystem that has a full range of incomes and employees just you know, like every community. But in order to make meaningful change, more needs to be done. It's important that we do disruptive new build, and Factory OS is a part of that fight, but it is insufficient to actually address the problem. And in fairness, this problem won't be solved in our lifetime. It is that profound. The, the winners in, in the industry 10 years from now are gonna be the ones that adopt these methods, but we need the governments and municipalities behind it too. And they need to open up the land where the people want to live. The biggest bottleneck is the process of getting planning approvals and getting permission to build at the end of the day. It doesn't help that shorten the entire process if you can't have the certainty about when you'll be able to start based on your planning approvals. We've demonstrated and are continuing to demonstrate that we can make a huge dent in the affordable and supportive housing arena so that we can get people off the streets and give people 
beautiful homes to live in at a far more economically reasonable value.